Today we have a unique combat story. As you know, I'm fascinated by the experiences of warriors in combat, and I've always wanted to better understand what that experience would have been like for some of the warriors of history, like the Spartans, Romans, or Mongols. On this episode, we'll interview Professor Barry Strauss, an accomplished scholar, historian, and expert on ancient military history. Barry brings to life a very famous Spartan warrior named Brasidas as we dive into his combat story. Brasidas led warriors into remarkable battles, employing conventional tactics that we see among the Spartan community, but also leveraging special operations and psychological or hybrid warfare with great success. Barry gives us a front row seat of what it was like to grow up and live in this austere, militaristic, and aggressive society that we know as Sparta. We could not have done this without Barry, who is a professor of history and classics at Cornell University, series editor of Princeton's Turning Points in Ancient History, author of eight books, and a military and naval historian and consultant. He's a recognized authority on the subject of leadership and the lessons that can be learned from the experiences of the greatest political and military leaders of the ancient world. He has a new book coming out in March 2022 titled The War That Made the Roman Empire, Anthony, Cleopatra, and Octavian at Actium. I hope you enjoy this unique combat story of Brasidas and the dive into the world of Sparta as much as I did. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Barry, thanks for taking the time to share the story of another veteran with us today. Ryan, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So I wanted to give a little background for our listeners because this is going to be slightly different than what we typically do Mm -hmm. on Combat Story, where we we love to hear the story of veterans. Right. And just from a personal perspective for me, Mm -hmm. for those who listen, um, I've always been uh, very interested in the lives of these veterans, not Mm -hmm. just the people we've talked to on the show, but as you look back historically at who I might even see as as the forebearers of of the military doctrine that we use, um, the tactics we employ today, whether it's looking at Genghis Khan, we're looking at the Spartans, Rome, um, Zulu warriors. I I just find it fascinating. And I hate that we can't teleport back in time and ask these same questions of these, of these warriors, because I strongly suspect they dealt with a lot of the same problems we as modern day veterans dealt with when we were in combat, which is, probably deploying to places, not seeing your family for a long time, Yeah. Um, mentally trying to get your head wrapped around getting into combat in a life right. or death situation, Right. right. Um, losing brothers and sisters in combat, and then how you deal with everything on the back end. I, I just would have yeah. loved to have heard it. We've all seen the movies. We've read books about these people. Mm-hmm. And what I wanted to do was bring one of these veterans, these warriors to life. And I thought right. a great start here would be a, a Spartan warrior. Because a lot of the people we interview either have Spartan uh, icons, uh, part of their logo for a company that they might run, has the, the iconic helmet or the right. shield. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we can, we can really relate to that warrior mentality. So we thought that would be a great place to start. And yeah. Barry, we found you because we know you have a deep history in uh, both geopolitical, military, and ancient studies. And we wanted to help bring to life one of these veterans. So thank you very much for taking the time to do this with us. It is a great pleasure and honor to be here. So before we dive into this individual, <laughs> and we're going to bring to life a real person here who right. um, who we, we actually have some documentation on. But before we get there, I want to make sure we talk just a bit about yourself, Barry, to understand how you found your way to this line of work, what interested you originally in uh, the, the ancient history, the military side of things? What was it for you growing up and, and through your studies? Uh, you know, well, both my my dad and my grandfather were veterans. There, each one was a machine gunner in the U.S. Army. My grandfather in World War One in France, and my father in World War Two in Italy. They both were combat soldiers, um, and my father. My grandfather was gassed and my father had a million dollar wound, uh, which got him out of the battlefield on New Year's Eve of 1944. Um, he had hepatitis. Uh, but um, uh, and I grew up during the Vietnam era. Uh, I, I didn't have to face the draft. I was just young enough that um, I didn't 
uh, I wasn't going to be sent to Vietnam. I wasn't drafted. Um, I could have volunteered, but I didn't, um, for better or worse. And I, I guess I was always interested in in military things. It's not so unusual for people who grew up uh, with the greatest generation. So in college, I had great teachers. And when I was a freshman, um, we read Thucydides, and I was shocked to see how relevant it was, to use the term of art then. It really seemed to speak to things that were going on in the 1970s, even though it had been written uh, well over 2,000 years before, almost 2,500 years before. And, and that got me hooked. Although, honestly, I, I decided I wanted to go to graduate school to um, do a PhD in history. Although before that, I thought I was going to be a newspaper reporter. I was an undergraduate reporter and editor. And then I got a job as an intern in a newspaper and I realized this is not for me. So I decided to go to grad school. I was lucky enough to be able to go to a great program at Yale. And it really was a toss up between modern European history, particularly German and ancient Greece. And um, partly because I, I, I never really had fantastic teachers in both subjects. Uh, I think it was the chance to spend a summer in Germany and a summer in Greece for better or worse. I decided, you know, I, I think I'd rather spend more time in Greece. So, <laughs> so I did. And uh, I always loved, I mean, I loved all those histories, German history, European history, Greek history, um, Roman history. Uh, even after graduate school, I wasn't sure whether I'd go into the foreign service or have an academic career, but they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And I've been at Cornell ever since, and it's been a fantastic experience and a really great ride. So keeps me busy, keeps me out of trouble, I think. Perfect. And I think, you know, people have heard your background as, as we introduced you, but um, you've written several books on these, uh, this time frame. you know, the ancient, right. Right. ancient history, both from a leadership right. perspective, which I think is, is interesting how you can apply that today but also just uh, the military side of things. So we're, right. we're truly dealing with somebody who's looked at this extensively, and I, I greatly appreciate that. So if if we can kick off here with, uh, sure. with Sparta, I right. want to first, because for myself, you know, I've read uh, Gates of Fire. Is that it? Uh, yes, Gates of Fire. Yeah. Gates of Fire. Obviously, many people have seen 300. There's other movies out there. Yeah. Let's yeah. start with what is fact what is fiction from what hollywood and modern day um, writing would tell us about those times right well uh, gates of fire is mostly fact uh there's a little bit of fiction um uh, 300 has more fiction although it is true to the spirit of how the greeks saw the persian enemy um they saw them as barbarians they called them barbarians and as effete effeminate hardly worthy of fighting them and the movie i think gets that right. Um, the Spartans uh, were extraordinary soldiers. They were really the only professional soldiers in Greece in this period. And, and what you see in both the book, uh, what you read in the book, what you see in the movie are true. It, it's true. The Spartans made this fantastic stand at Thermopylae. It's a force of several thousand Greeks spearheaded by 300 elite Spartan soldiers. And they, they held the Persians up for three days in a very narrow pass. And the reason they were able to do that is, is because Sparta was not just a, a, military, a set of military tactics. It was an entire society that was set up to create these elite soldiers. And it reverberated all through the society. I can talk further so, if you'd like. No, no, no. Actually, I think that, that that's a nice way to, to kick us off. And since right. we're going to be talking about Sparta, Greece at this time, can right. we set the, the time period for people to just give them context? And maybe sure. who were some of the world powers at that time? Or, or was it very localized just to Greece? So we're going to be looking at the 5th century BC, the 400s BC or BCE. Some people say either way is correct. Uh, early in the century, the Greeks defeated uh, an invasion of Greece by the Persian Empire, which was the largest empire that the world had ever known to that date. The Chinese Empire didn't exist yet uh, when the Persian Empire invaded Greece in um, 480 BC. And it's, it's, we have only have rough and ready figures, but it's possible that 20% of the human race lived in the Persian Empire. It stretched from what is nowadays uh, northeastern Greece 
all the way to the Indo-Pakistani border. It was huge. Uh, Libya, Egypt, and, and all of Southwest Asia and much of Central uh, Asia as well. And the Greeks were able to defeat this Persian invasion. Uh, it was triumph of a middle-sized power against an overextended large power. And like so many large powers, the Persians thought that technology and money uh, and the big numbers would be bound to win, but they didn't reckon with the Greek spirit of resistance and the cunning of their plans. And it was a combined Athenian and Spartan-led uh, resistance. Um, Athens led, uh, Sparta led on land and Athens led on sea. Technically, Sparta led both on land and sea, but in fact, it was the Athenians who were the brains behind the sea um, resistance to Persia. And it, the naval resistance was essential in order to set things up so that the Spartan-led Greek armies were finally able to defeat the Persians on land as well. And they did so in, in 480 and 479 BC and pushed the Persians back across the Aegean Sea uh, away from what's nowadays the Turkish coast. They were uh, forced back inland. And all that area came under Greek control, liberated mostly Greek city-states, and Athens went into the vacuum and created a naval empire. The Spartans allowed the Athenians to do this because Spartan society depended on isolation and being closed from the outside world. Very strange society. Uh, in the beginning, the two sides got along, but as the years went by, they fought with each other more and more. Sparta, a closed society, um, to make a long story short, it was an oligarchy. It was ruled by a few men and a small number of families. Athens was a democracy. It was open. It was enlightened. It was forward-looking. It believed in individual liberty. The Spartans believed in individual obedience to uh, the state as a whole. They're both very idealistic, but in different ways. And the Spartans came to conclude that the Athenians challenged their way of life uh, and their society down to its roots. And so they fought a series of wars, one in the mid-century that was indecisive. And then finally, one of the most famous wars in history, what we call the Peloponnesian War, war between the Athenians and the Spartans and the coalitions that each side led. Uh, uh, it started out in what is roughly the modern country of Greece, but including the Turkish coast. Uh, it spread westward to Sicily and Southern Italy, because those areas, Eastern Sicily and Southern Italy were inhabited by Greeks in that, that period. Um, it also eventually sucked in the Persians who re-entered Greek warfare uh, in order to keep both sides fighting each other and eventually uh, to help the Spartans to win. So it was a titanic struggle. It, it was an intermittent struggle lasting on and off, but for the better part of 27 years from 431 to 404 BC. And it's so famous because one of the great classics of strategy and military history ever written is about this war. It's Thucydides, the Peloponnesian War, still studied in war colleges around the world today, and rightly so. The perfect context. And since we're talking about 400 years BC, right? how, how is it we know so much about this time, right? Like, that seems so long ago, but I think in this case, we're fortunate because there's so much written text that we can still draw on. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, we don't know as much as we'd like to, and a modern historian would probably tear his or her hair out over the state of the sources. But first of all, we have this monumental work by Thucydides. He was a general in the war, a failed general. Uh, and then he was a very wealthy man who went into exile from Athens and decided to write a history of the war. Uh, it's a brilliant book. It's a peculiar book. He's got his axes to grind. There were other histories of the war written at the time. They do not survive, but they are quoted in later sources that come from the Roman era. So we have those as well. Then um, some really famous works of literature come in this period. The playwright Aristophanes wrote comedies about the war and about Athenian politics. The most famous is called Lysistrata. It's about how the women of Greece go on a sex strike to try to get the men to stop fighting this war. Um, there are tragedies written about this period as well that refer obliquely to the war. The most famous is Oedipus, Oedipus Rex, is a book about the Peloponnesian War on a certain level. We have inscriptions. So Athens was a democracy and the Athenians published 
um, state decisions, decisions of the state. They published them on stone. A lot of those have survived. Not a lot, but some of them. A fair amount have survived. Coins as well. We have coins in this period. Coins were a key tool of propaganda. Um, and there's archaeology. Archaeology is limited in what it can tell us, uh, but it does tell us some things. We have fortresses. We have naval installations from archaeology. Uh, we have arms and armor. Uh, there were uh, there were monuments put up to the war, and we have some of those monuments. So. Scholars like me are uh, detectives. We are piecing together uh, what we know about the war from all these sources. We also include what we know about ancient warfare more generally. But, and sometimes we bring in what we know about modern warfare. We have to be really cautious because there are huge differences between ancient and modern warfare, but there are also some things that stayed the same. So that's how we piece together the story. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, so great way to, to kick this off then. And why don't we introduce our protagonist or the person we're going to be following through here. Right. Yeah. And then just to, as I mentioned to you previously, Barry, what I typically do as I'm talking to veterans, I like to understand how they grew up, the environment right. that they were in. Right. So right. We can talk about this character and what yeah. that early sure. part of his life may sure. have been like. Sure. So his name is Brasidus. His father's name was Tellus. So he was Brasidus, the son of Tellus. I don't think we know his mother's name. He was a Spartan. He died in the year 422 BC. He probably was getting close to 40 when he died. I'm guessing he was born around 460 BC, but we don't actually know. We know that he was a commander of a district um, in Spartan territory in 431, and he wouldn't have had that responsible position if he wasn't close to 30. Um, and probably wasn't all that much more than 40 when he died, because what he does is such a tremendous feat. Uh, he might have been as, as old as 50, but older than that, it's hard to see anyone being in shape to, to do it. Uh, he is a great Spartan warrior. Um, he, in some ways, is a pioneer of special operations, of uh, irregular warfare, and of hybrid warfare. He was a very unusual Spartan. Although in some ways he was a typical Spartan, and we know a lot about him because he is personally responsible for Thucydides' mess up, for the reason why Thucydides was forced into exile. Uh, Brasidas was the man uh, who won a victory that made Thucydides look terrible. And so in a way, Thucydides is dedicated to telling us about Brasidas. Um, we need to be careful and make sure Thucydides isn't building him up to be a Superman. And I think we can, we can control for that. But we learn a lot about him from Thucydides. and It's tremendously valuable and important. Perfect. Yeah, I was going to ask, can we trust what Thucydides writes? Is he trying to debase or debunk some of the effort or is he is he trying to show that he, he was defeated by somebody very just powerful? The, and, just the opposite. He's trying to show that he was defeated by someone very powerful. Yeah. But um, Thucydides is uh, a very good scholar. It's often been said that he often gives us the evidence in the news pages that allows us to contradict his opinions and his editorial pages. He doesn't have news pages and editorial pages, but he clearly has an ax to grind. He has a series of axes to grind, but he gives us a lot of information and we can put it together with other sources of information. So yeah, we don't have to think that Brasidus was a Superman and we can question some of the things Thucydides says. His achievement was still pretty darn great. So then let's talk about how somebody like him would have grown up. What is right. their life like and the pipeline into becoming a Spartan warrior? Right. So Sparta is a society with three classes. At the top are the full Spartan warriors. Originally, when Spartan system started, maybe around 650 BC, there were about 9,000 of them. But now we're near the Peloponnesian War, so there's maybe more like 7,000 or even 5,000 of them. Um, the second group in Spartan society is called the Neighbors. They are free, but they are not full Spartan citizens, and they don't go through the training of Spartan soldiers. And then the third group is called the helots, a word that might mean captives. These are serfs. It's important to understand that all of the Greek city-states exploited unfree labor. The Athenians had slaves. In some ways, the Athenian system was even more brutal than the Spartan system. But the Greeks thought the Athenian system was more okay because the Athenians... Um, enslaved foreigners, not Greeks. 
The Spartans ensurfed fellow Greeks, which to other Greeks uh, was outrageous. You might say that's that's an ethnocentric and maybe even in a racist position. And you'd be right if you if you take that position. So Sparta and Athens both depended on unfree labor. In Sparta, what this unfree labor allowed full Spartan citizens to do is it allowed the males to devote their lives to the military profession. And it allowed the females to devote their lives to a, a, a weird kind of public education and being supportive of the males. So Spartan males would be raised at home by their, uh, by their parents, mostly their mothers, till the age of seven. When a Spartan male was born, by the way, he, in the first 10 days, he had to go to an inspector. And if an inspector felt that he was sickly and not likely to make it, uh, he would be taken from his parents or she and put out on um, in, a, in a canyon. Uh, they are left either to die or perhaps to be sold, brought, brought up by a slave dealer. Uh, it's very harsh, but it's not all that much harsher in Athens. In Athens, it wasn't up to the state. It was up to the father to make this decision. And presumably fathers were less... Um, were much softer than the state in deciding who would live and who would die. Anyhow, if they made the cut, they lived at home for the first seven years. And then if you were a male, you then went to live in a barracks when you went through what the Spartans called the upbringing. The upbringing was unique in the Greek world. It was a uh, professional military training uh, that emphasized uh, austerity, toughness, devotion to the state, cunning. Um, Spartans have a reputation. The Athenians gave them for a reputation for being ignoramuses because they weren't trained in poetry and drama and literature the way Athenians were. But they were trained to be astute and cunning and shrewd and patriotic. Um, the Spartan preferred way of speech was kind of a yep, nope way of talking. Brief pithy to the point. Uh, the most famous example, well, I'll tell you in a minute the most famous example, but this kind of speech is called laconic. We still use the word today for pithy speech, and it comes from the name of the geographical region of Sparta was located, Laconia. So Spartan boys would be in an age-graded group. You'd be in the barracks with guys your same age. Uh, and you'd also be trained to live off the land. Uh, you'd only have one cloak, or excuse me, one change of cloaks. Uh, you'd be sent out in the countryside and be forced to fend for yourself. Uh, it was extremely tough. And as they got older, they were trained to fight in the heavy armed infantry that was peculiar to Greece in this period. It's called a hoplite phalanx. A hoplite is a fully armed soldier wearing heavy bronze armor, with bronze and iron weapons. A phalanx is the unit in which they fought. Um, in order to fight in a unit, training was essential. Um, and you needed to trust the people around you. You could, couldn't hear very well and you couldn't see very well. You had to fight as a unit and you needed not to run away when the going got rough. And the Spartans were expert in this. Also expert in closing gaps in the lines. In a sense, this kind of battle was ritualistic. It was a kind of dance. It was done to the, the rhythm of flute players. All the Greeks engaged in it, but the Spartans were the masters because they were the only ones who did it in a professional sort of way. Now, um, I should say that before joining the Spartan army, Around the age of 18 or possibly 20, a Spartan boy would then go for a year or two in what is called the Secret Service. We don't know exactly what the Secret Service did. Um, it might have simply been a rite of passage, such as all Greek city-states had, uh, for boys to turn into men as soldiers. There's some evidence to think that what the Spartans did during this rite of passage was they messed with the helots. They went into helot country um, and they, they messed with them. Uh, they had the right to kill any helots who were too uppity. Every year on New Year's Day, the Spartan state declared war on the helots. And uh, any Spartan citizen could kill a helot with impunity and would not be uh, guilty of murder. Of course, the Spartans didn't want to go around killing a lot of helots because they needed them for um, uh, their society to work. The helots were the farmers. They uh, were the laborers. They were the agricultural workforce. The neighbors were... Merchants, 
and craftsmen. Sparta didn't have much of a merchant economy. Sparta didn't even have coins. They used clumsy iron spits. Spartans believed that their state should be austere, that it should be closed off from the rest of the Greek world. They had, unlike the rest of Greece, they had very limited art, very limited poetry. They did not allow, allow many foreigners in, and every year they had a festival called the Kicking Out of Foreigners Day, um, which tells us something about them. But I need to say I need to say something about Spartan women because they're a really important part of the story. In spite of all of this, Spartan women were the freest women in Greece. They were the only women in the Greek world who got public education. No other women in Greece got public education. Many of them got private education. In Sparta. Women were trained by the state, uh, and they were trained in gymnastics. They were trained in exercise. They were trained to be tough. Uh, the Spartans believe that women needed to be tough, not just uh, to survive the rigors of childbirth, but they also believed in a kind of Lysenkoism, that tough women would give birth to tough, uh, genetically tough uh, warriors. Um, the women also clearly got some kind of fundamental education in household management, because where the men were away fighting, it's the women who ran the households in Sparta. And the women were also trained to be the support of men, but to engage in tough love, the ultimate tough love. So now let me get to that example of Spartan laconic um, speech that I promised. Um, it's the most famous example. Uh, it's about the Spartan man who goes off to battle and his mother looks at him and his shield and says, with it or on it, with it or on it. What does that mean? Well, the Greeks used shields as ambulances. If you were wounded or dead, um, you would be brought back on your shield. When a Greek uh, formation lost a battle, the temptation was to throw away your shield and run away as fast as you could to save your life. But someone who threw away his shield was called in Sparta a trembler, a trembler. And that was the worst thing you could be called. So what the Spartan mother was saying to her son was, I'd rather you came back dead than come back alive and without your shield. We also know that when Spartans lost battles and their heavy casualties, the members of the family were supposed to go around wearing wreaths of joy and celebrate uh, because uh, the members of their family had died for Sparta. Sparta was also proud of the fact that it was the one Greek city-state that had no wall. The Spartans said, we don't need any walls because we have our men. We're the only city-state in Greece that produces real men. <laughs> and to some extent, this boast was true. When it came to land armies and fighting, the Spartans really were the best. They built up a coalition of like-minded city-states, some of whom they had conquered. They conquered their neighbors. That's how they originally ensurfed the Helots. They conquered them. Um, they lived to the west of Spartan territory. Sparta is located in the Peloponnesus, uh, that southern part of Greece that kind of looks like a three-pronged peninsula. Um, Sparta is in the central part of it. Uh, the Helots live mostly to the west, the western prong, very, very fertile farm country. And it's because the Spartans control the Helots that um, they, they're able to devote themselves to military activities. That's okay. a ba basic overview of Sparta. Oh, that's great. No, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was going to ask, is, as the children are pulled out when they're seven, is, is this something where they're moved to like the other side of the country, basically? Or are they still able to see their families periodically? It's just every now and then. Good question. They're able to see their families periodically, but only every now and then. They're meant to develop a fundamental loyalty to their group of male brothers. It's so fundamental that after they become full Spartan soldiers, um, they then join eating clubs or, if you will, fraternities messes, if you prefer, and that's where they take their meals for the rest of their lives. Um, some sources claim that when Spartan males married, they had to sneak off to see their wives at night. I don't know if that's true or not, um, but um, they had this loyalty to the male group of fellow soldiers uh, that's tremendously effective in building cohesion. I mean, all Greek militaries in this period depend on cohesion, but nobody does it better than, nobody does it better than the Spartans. And then you mentioned around 
18 years old to go out for the secret service effort. Right. Right. Are, are they, would they have been deployed into combat before that? Or is it, they have no. to kind of get through this process? No, and then no, no. They have to get through this process. This is typical of all Greek city States. So, um, they have to go through this period, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, transitional phase from being a trainee, from being a cadet, if you will, to being a full soldier. Uh, in other Greek city states, um, the 18 to 20 year old, so in Athens, they serve in frontier fortresses um, and they go on raids in the frontier, but they, they don't serve in the line, in the military line until they're in Athens until they're 20. Um, so one thing about yeah. one thing you should know about Sparta is most of our information in this period comes from Athens. The Spartans kicked out foreigners and they used secrecy as a weapon. They wanted people to keep people guessing what was really going on. So one scholar wrote a really good book about Sparta called The Spartan Mirage. And it's something of a mirage because to some extent, we just have to try to piece together what was going on there. So it's, it's interesting as we kind of start talking about what the next step is once they get through their cadet or, or training program, you mentioned the phalanx, right? Which is a right. very famous, well-known right. military formation. Right, right. right. But it, it, in my mind, it insinuates that this conventional approach, right? Like heavy, mili- heavy infantry, for right. lack of a better term, organized very tightly, moving as a pack, right. easy to see and detect. Right, um, but then they also have this more pl- nefarious, malicious, uh, secretive side right. to them. Which might be right. where the special forces comes up. But it, I'm, I'm trying to balance the two. Is, is it it's, more conventional, and then it bleeds? It's into much stuff. more. It's much more conventional. Much more conventional. Uh, the Spartans had not. I mean, they, the Spartans would do unconventional things. Um, to protect their security. So one infamous thing is that several decades before the period we're talking about, um, the Spartans sent out a call to the Helots saying, uh, we're looking for a few good men. We want all the best and bravest Helots to come to Sparta and we're gonna train you to uh, be in the Spartan military. And as our sources tell us, nobody ever saw those guys again. (laughs) That only works once though, I would imagine. (laughs) It only works once, but the Spartans were very brutal. Um, You know, the Athenians did some awful things. They engaged in war atrocities, but they agonized over them. As far as we know, the Spartans didn't agonize over them. Yeah, man. Okay, then when they finish their training, one thing that we obviously see different, I think it's different today, where you've got people who spend their life on the enlisted side, and Mm -hmm. then you've got officers who come in, did they have, from a young age, did they have the same disparity? Do you even know that? Or does everybody start out the same and then officers rise up through the ranks? You know, that's an excellent question. Uh, we know that there, in theory, all Spartans are equals. They call themselves the similars. They call themselves the similars. But in practice, they're not all equal. Every Spartan ha- family has an inherited inherited a basic land allotment. But some of the families have much, much more land. And over the generations, Spartan families engaged in a marriage strategy that would uh, put the land in fewer and fewer hands. It would make families wealthy and make the elite richer. But the numbers of Spartans went down. So I don't know that we know how people became officers, but I think almost certainly uh, in general, it's from the elite. Were there battlefield um, uh, promotions? Yeah, there, there were battlefield promotions. But I don't think you get to be a Spartan officer unless you come in some sense from elite, if you belong, you need to belong to the right fraternity or you need to be uh, know the right people. Um, it's a it's a very cliquey society. It's a very cliquey yeah. society. And then uh, again, I'm, I'm not sure if we, we would know something like this, but as we talk about the. The operational tempo, if you will, right. you mentioned 27 years of war, um, right. they're well known military society. Right. How, right. how frequently are they out in a skirmish or an engagement or a campaign? So the traditional Greek way of war is to fight only in the spring and the summer and maybe the very beginning of the fall. Uh, the winter and the fall are farming seasons and Greek soldiers are, are typically farmers. Uh, they don't want to be away from their homeland all that long. Spartans, of course, are a little bit different because they've got the helots to farm themselves. But the Spartan authorities 
are very concerned that Spartans will be corrupted. Remember, Spartans aren't allowed to have coins. They aren't allowed to have gold. And yet we know that some Spartans did. They went abroad. You know, it's the old story. How are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? Well, Spartans go abroad and they get wildly corrupted. Wow, we don't have to live this way. We can eat fancy food because Spartan diet is very, very plain and simple, very austere. You know, we can have luxuries, wine, women, and song. So the Spartans don't want to stay away from home all that long. And they are not very original in the way they fight wars until Brasidas. And it's one of the reasons why Brasidas is is so important because he's an original, unusual, original thinking Spartan. Well, that's a perfect segue then. So we, we understand kind of how Brasidas and his peers would have would have been raised into right. this military yes. society. We understand yeah. the way that they interacted with the people around him. Let's, where do we pick up with Brasidas in his career um, right. from the written well, text? So let's start when he's, I'm guessing around 30, maybe younger. Um, it's the summer of 431 BC, the first year of the Peloponnesian War. And the Athenians are engaging in what some scholars call pinprick raids around Spartan territory. They're looking to take um, uh, crucial strategic places, but they're not engaging in an all out war with Sparta. The Athenian strategy, crazy as it sounds, is to uh, have, well, what, what in the 18th century they called cabinet wars, uh, in which you'd fight a few battles and everybody would make up and go home. Uh, and that's what the Athenians are trying to do. So uh, at one point in the summer, they send a big expedition of 150 warships. These are galleys, um, maybe 20, 30 Marines on each of these galleys, 100 Athenians, 50 allied ships. And they head for a very strategic place in the southwestern corner of the Peloponnesus. It's a place called Methoni. If you visit Greece nowadays and go to Methoni, you're going to see this spectacular castle there that was built by the Venetians and then um, updated by the Ottoman Turks. The Venetians called it one of the two eyes of the Republic because it's such an important stopping point on the route between Italy and uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. So the Athenians have these uh, 150 ships and the place, Sparta was not on top of it. Didn't expect them to come. There's no real garrison there and the walls are in bad shape. And the Athenians send their troops out. Some are going to the walls. Others are scattering to raid the area. The guy in charge of this district is Brasidas. It's the first time we meet him. What does he do? He takes 100 Spartan hoplites, fully armed, heavy armed soldiers, and he busts through the Athenian line. Uh, he shocks them. They're not expecting him. They're paying attention to the people inside the walls. He has only very light casualties, and he gets inside the wall. And he's so charismatic uh, and has such elite soldiers with him that he's able to organize the resistance and they are able to save this place. Um, and the Athenians are forced to leave. He's the first Spartan soldier to be decorated by his government in, in the war. That's when, that's when we first meet him. So this, this is really, I think, a pretty great achievement. And, and it sounds like he's significantly outnumbered, but maybe did, Very. did were they able to land all 150 galleys? Well, we don't know that. We don't, we don't know that. But, you know, one thing about the Spartans is the Athenians were scared out of their minds of them. Uh, in, in this kind of warfare, um, you know, the Spartans were the NFL and the Athenians were a high school team. Um, that's, and they were really scared of Spartan soldiers. And that, I think, was part of it. To see them come busting through. It's a little bit like later on Spartacus and the gladiators, how they terrified the Romans. Um, they're scared of these guys. I think that's a part yeah, of it. So this is a significant win for, for him. We, yes. It could be middle of his career at this time. Um, probably, over, pretty, probably pretty early. I mean, we don't know much about him. He's the commander of this district. Um, I'm not sure we know how big a district it is. It's an important district, uh, but he really does a lot with very little. And where do we see him come up next? Do, do we kind of follow him from campaign to campaign? Yeah, um, so this is, um, yeah, this is 431. And we see him all the way till the time when he dies in 422. So nine years later, um, 425, uh, the Athenians are back in this part of the world. But uh, this time they're trying to be there to stay. They build a fortress on a, a rocky spot 
that's uh, very well protected. They build a fortress, uh, which they want to use to encourage helots to run away from their Spartan masters. The Indians had done this before in an earlier war, uh, and the Spartans are scared to death of it. Um, they're scared of the Athenian navy, but the Spartans try to uh, land on this spot. Um, they try to get their ships to land on the spot and uh, have an assault on this. It's a little bit like taking Point du Hoc on D-Day. And the guy leading this is Brasidas. Can I read you a little bit from what the sources have to say about this? Please. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. So this is uh, Thucydides. Okay. So Brasidas was captain of a galley, and he was the one who most distinguished himself. Seeing that the captains and steersmen, impressed by the difficulty of the position, hung back even when a landing might have seemed possible for fear of wrecking their vessels, he shouted out to them that they must never allow the enemy to fortify himself in their country for the sake of saving timber, but must shiver their vessels and force a landing, and bade the allies, instead of hesitating in such a moment, to sacrifice their ships for Sparta in return for her many benefits, to run them boldly aground, land in one way or another, and make themselves masters of the place and its garrison. And then uh, a little later, he, 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 you know, he tries to get them to do this, to, to land, even if it's going to hurt their ships and force a landing on this rocky point. Um, he forced his own steerman, steersman to run his ship ashore and stepping onto the gangway, he was trying to land when he was cut down by the Athenians. And after receiving many wounds, he fainted away. Falling into the bow of the ship, his shield slipped off his arm into the sea. And being thrown ashore, he was picked up by the Athenians. The shield was, excuse me. Being thrown ashore, the shield was picked up by the Athenians and afterwards used for the trophy, which they set up for this attack. So here's Brasidas trying once again to break through the Athenians and do something heroic. He's having a lot of trouble uh, convincing his men to follow him. And he's wounded. Uh, he's wounded and he loses his shield, as I mentioned. That's a huge uh, humiliation for uh, the Spartans. Do, do we see this? This is a Spartan victory in the end? Do, no, are they, no, they're not no, it's a failure. It's a failure. And not only that, they then try to, um, they try a different uh, technique to, a different tactic. They land a force of Spartans on an island, um, almost a sandbar that's right next to this fortification. Uh, and they think that those Spartans are going to be able to attack the Athenians, intimidate them, but it's a, a, a complete mess up. They don't have the ships and they underestimate the Athenians. The Athenians engage in a special op of their own. They use helots who have defected to them quite some time earlier. And those helots are able to climb a steep cliff, even more Pont d'Oc, um, and they are able to surround the Spartan soldiers and force the Spartans to surrender, which is a huge humiliation after Thermopylae, wow. the Spartans forced, fought to the last man. And now the Spartans sue for peace, and the Athenians refuse. Wow. So it's after this that Brasidas comes back with his great coup, his brilliant plan. He says can, this. Can I ask? Yes, sorry, please. Just, just before you jump. So yeah. the, that first engagement where we see him is, yeah. is fully land based, it sounds. Yes. Like got yes, it's fully land based. 100. And yeah. then he's got this amphibious assault, almost like a marine type. Yes. Um, yes. Endeavor. Absolutely. Yes. That's, that's yeah. interesting. They would use them interchangeably. It makes sense. It sounds yeah. like they're all built to be like almost like a Marine Corps. A Marine would be. Yeah. Um, you know, every, every Marine or rifleman. Yeah. So it, it was just yeah. interesting to hear that those yeah. two. Yeah. Right, you know, right. we, don't, we don't know much about the Marines in antiquity, but one image we have of a Marine shows him with a helmet, uh, the same kind of helmet you would see a heavy armed infantryman on shore. Uh, opinions differ as to whether they wore armor uh, for shipboard fighting or not. Obviously, it would protect them, but if you get thrown into the water and you're wearing armor, goodbye. So, um, in this case, I'm sure they were wearing armor because they were planning to, uh, I expect they were because they are planning to go on shore. It's unusual for the Spartans to fight in this way, but that's nothing compared to what's next. So Brasidas convinces the powers that be in Sparta that the now they have this real problem. The Athenians have a fort in Helot country and Helots are escaping. They're escaping from their masters. This is really bad for business. And so Brasidas says, we're going to bring the war to the Athenians where they never expect it. 
we're going to march across hostile territory in central Greece, and we're going to go all the way to the northeastern Aegean. So to the east of the modern city of Salonika, Thessaloniki, and we're going to attack the Athenian colonies there, the Athenian allies there. This is a real, this is the soft underbelly of the Athenian empire because they need this area to get the uh, materials that they need for their navy, uh, the timber, the tar, and the pitch, and also because it's an important gold mine there. And the Athenians, he says, aren't prepared for it. Um, I think the authorities probably thought he was a bit nuts to want to do this, and they won't give him any full Spartans. Instead, he has to take a, a large version of the Dirty Dozen, if that means anything to people today. Um, so let me just get the numbers. Um, he's got 700 helots, 700 helots and a thousand mercenaries from the Peloponnesus. And he arms them all as heavy infantrymen. So I don't want to give you the wrong impression that Brasidas um, is thinking about light arm tactics, although he does use some later on. He's still thinking in fairly conventional tactical terms, but the strategy is incredibly daring uh, to march across hostile territory and fetch up in Northern Greece. And, but, but that is exactly what he does between 424 and 422 BC. Um, and it's really very successful. Um, it's successful in part because Brasidas is a very unusual Spartan. Thucydides says Brasidas was not a bad speaker for a Spartan. He was able to talk to people and persuade them and also intimidate them into surrendering. Um, the other thing that he did, and this was very Spartan, you know, he convinced the other Greeks that he was a paradigm of traditional manly infantry virtue. He's what the Greeks called a good man. Uh, and by that, they didn't mean a morally good person, but they meant somebody who was a great warrior. And the Spartans were really good at convincing people that they were great warriors. Brasidas and his forces show up outside various Athenian allied cities in northeastern Greece. Brasidas talks to them um, and he says, look, we've come to liberate you. And you could hear the grumbling where they say, we don't want to be liberated. We're happy being Athenian allies. Furthermore, we're really concerned that if, you liber if we join you, the Athenians will come back and uh, kick our behinds because they've got a great navy and you don't. He says, no problem. If you don't want to be liberated, that's okay. We will simply destroy all your crops in the field. He goes just before the harvest time. It's your choice. You can be liberated, you can be free, or you can be starving. And they choose to be liberated. This tactic works a number of times. Um, he gets allies from uh, the local people who are really good at light arm troops. Uh, and they join him. This is an area adjacent to the part of the ancient world called Thrace. It's roughly modern Bulgaria. Uh, the Thracians are famous as light armed soldiers, hit and run soldiers. And he starts to use them as well, mostly emphasizing the heavy infantry. Barry, could I ask, it, yeah. should we be surprised that he's able to take a force of 1,700 non-Spartan warriors and do this? I mean, yes. part of the reason they're doing this or the helots are, are fleeing or trying to rebel or being subversive, and he's given 700 of them. Right. Are the mercenaries strong enough to keep them in check when there's no other Spartans? <sighs> really good question. I think it's partly because he's promising the helots freedom um, back mm. in, in Sparta. Yeah. Uh, eventually, the Spartans, in order to increase their population, have to order offer citizenship and freedom to non-Spartans and even to helots. And they'd always had to use helots in the military. They just didn't like to admit it because there weren't enough Spartans. I think it's partly that. I think it's partly you've, you hit on a really good point. Thank you. I think Brasidas is just an incredible leader. Uh, yeah. He's a man of amazing charisma that he's able to pull this off. And it's so rare for a Spartan to be able to do this. Uh, maybe not as rare as an Athenian author would like to think, but he's using Spartan skills of, you know, impressing people with the whole package. Um, I think we see that with special forces today, you know, where um, these are some pretty impressive people. And mm -hmm. I think um, that 
that helps them. Uh, we know oh, the Romans did this as well. And we know the Romans were really good at kind of talking to people they would have considered barbarians. And we know that one of the things they did was they exchanged daggers. I had a student who did a really wonderful master's thesis year, a, a few years ago about the Roman and barbarian daggers that we find, both in archaeological context, but also in the rivers of Northern Europe, where the German tribes and, and Celtic tribesmen would, would throw them in as an offering to the gods, Roman, Roman daggers. And I think Brasidas is just just brilliant at this, you know, in, in dealing with the locals. They're mostly Greek, though there's some non-Greeks, and in talking the helots into following him, and talking people into following him. And and we'll see this uh, in the rest of the story. If yeah, it sounds very much like the almost a modern day army special forces kind of working with local um, indigenous forces as a force multiplier and leading them through and having to, to inspire and drive them into difficult scenarios. I think it is to a degree, but I also think it's true that Brasidas is enough of a traditional Spartan that he only goes so far. His bread and butter is still heavy infantry tactics, but he, he does use these other tactics and he's really good at surprise. So his greatest coup is in the winter of, I think it's the winter of 423. Uh, he leads his army on a winter march at a rapid rate over a distance of, I'm going to say about 50 miles, um, to surprise the most important Athenian settlement in this area. It's a city called Amphipolis, which means city in the round. It's located on, a, on an island in a, a river that dominates communications in this part of the world. And that is the access point to the resources of the interior, both na uh, both uh, uh, mineral and, um, and, and natural, uh, mineral and vegetable. Yes. So trees, uh, timber, tar, pitch, and gold mines. And he gets there so fast and so shocks the people. And his reputation now is so big that the uh, people of the city decide to surrender to them. He says, everybody can leave. They can only take a small amount with them, but anyone who wants to leave can leave. And unlike the Taliban and cattle, they really let, he really lets them leave. Uh, there's an Athenian general there, uh, but he is unable to convince people to fight. Maybe this sounds familiar. Um, and they just decide to leave. Now, the Athenian commander of this whole part of northeastern Greece is with the Navy uh, a day or so sail away on an island off the coast. Uh, and he tries to get to Amphipolis as fast as he can. By the time he gets there, it's too late. The city has fallen. And his name is uh, Thucydides. And it's as a result of this that Thucydides, either by official decision of the Athenian state or because he decides he wants to save his skin, we really don't know, he goes into exile in the next 20 years. He's a very wealthy man, and he happens, his family happens to own estates in this part of the Greek world, and that's where he seems to live for the rest of the war, as far as we know. Now, as a result of this amazing coup, uh, other city-states fall to Brasidas, and Brasidas, into my mind, what is his most interesting, exciting operation, he goes for a city called Toroni. I know it sounds like Tortoni, like an Italian ice cream. It's called Toroni. Uh, it's um, on a peninsula in this part of northeastern Greece. Uh, it's got an Athenian garrison. And um, let me just check my notes because I, I want to do justice. Uh, I want to do justice to it. So, um, yeah, give me just a sec. No problem. No problem. Okay, so um, he arrives in the dark a little before daybreak and he camps about a half mile away. He then uh, tries to get 20 guys with daggers to, he has uh, partisans in the city who he's in touch with. He tries to get 20 guys with daggers to enter the city and working with the partisans to open the gates, but only seven of them get through. We don't know if it's because the others chicken out or because whatever, but only seven get through, but they are able to open the gates. And then he sends in 100 light armed troops that come from his native allies. They're called Peltas. This is the kind of hit and run soldiers. And he sends them in uh, and they're tremendously successful in terrorizing the city uh, and getting the uh, Athenian garrison 
um, there's a fire signal. The Peltas send in a fire signal. Um, and uh, I should say that the seven men, light arm men with daggers, kill the garrison on the highest post point in the city, and they open the rear gate of the city. Then Brassidus sends in the 100 Peltas. And then after a fire signal, Brassidus sends in the rest of his troops and takes the town by surprise. He's got about 2,000 troops. Once again, he speaks to an assembly, offering them freedom or else, and they decide to take the deal. The rest of the Athenian garrison has fled to a fortress on the seacoast about a mile or two away. You can actually visit it today. It's still there, the ruins of this fortress. And uh, Brasidas um, uses urban fighting tactics um, uh, using fire uh, and projectiles to uh, to take this and, and forces, uh, he defeats the Athenians in this place. So he completely uh, takes this town. It's really an interesting operation and it's not at all the kind of thing that you expect to see from the Spartans. Clearly this guy is thinking outside the box. But let me ask you this, yeah. Maria, as, as, as he marches north, it sounds like through through this difficult terrain and he's moving through these um, small settlements, it sounds like he's not fighting much to do this. It's more the psychological convincing people. Yes, I think that's right. I think that's right. Doesn't, we don't hear about him having a fight um, on uh, between place and place. It's so when he gets to a place, sometimes he convinces them, as in the first place I mentioned, and sometimes he is forced to use force uh, to get in and then uh, persuade the rest to uh, surrender. I think Tyrone is... The most exciting example of something that's like a special operation, so unlike what we're used to seeing in in this period. That, that's the sending the seven guys in in advance. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. W- was siege warfare common then? Like, would would the Spartans no. have laid siege to another settlement? They do lay siege to cities, but it's a it's a period in which siege warfare is is really very underdeveloped. The Greeks have ignored siege warfare, and it. it it remains for a, a later generation to turn the Greeks into great experts at siege warfare. I should say the Greeks and the Macedonians, because it's Philip and Alexander who bring it to its perfection. They haven't invented the torsion catapult yet. They're not able to do that. Uh, they're very limited in what they can do. Very, very limited in what they can so do. So his, his options then, if, if you don't have siege warfare, were to take the city by force. Pretty and much. And so he sends in this little special ops team basically ahead at night yeah. to get them in through the back door. Force or fraud. And that's what's True. so good about this. Yeah. Uh, the Spartans had had taken a city by siege earlier in the war in central Greece, but it took a very long time. It took over a year for them to succeed. So um, this is much better. In fairness, it's a, it's a, um, it's a softer target. They're not going to have the kind of uh, support that that city in central Greece on the border of Athens uh, had um, much easier to take this, but still quite an achievement. And the Athenians are running scared, and we know it because they send an expedition up north uh, to try to stop Brasidas. About 2,500 men, 2,000, 2,500 hoplites of their own and some cavalrymen. Uh, they are able to retake some of the cities that Brasidas lost, including Tyrone, that Brasidas took, that they lost to Brasidas, including Tyrone. But they have a problem when it comes to the crown jewels. The crown jewels is Amphipolis, the city in the round. Um, the Athenian force is led by a politician who thinks he's a general. He's a man named Cleon. He is Thucydides' number one enemy. And Thucydides has nothing good to say about him. He may be the man who forced Thucydides into exile. He probably is. And we have to be skeptical of what Thucydides says about Cleon. Still, just looking at the facts and leaving out the editorial comments, it does look like Cleon was not a very good general in his tactics that he used when uh, Brasidas was bottled up in Amphipolis. It looks that he, like he really did divide his forces um, so that Brasidas was able to go after smaller targets rather than having to deal with a bigger one. And he wasn't prepared for Brasidas. Brasidas comes out with a raid with 150 men and he plows into the, uh, he plows into the Athenian army. They attack suddenly. Uh, 
followed by the rest of the Spartan army uh, before the Athenians reinforcements are able to arrive. The Athenians see Spartans massing inside the city walls and they decide to retreat and await reinforcements. Smelling Athenian fear, Brasidas now strikes the Athenians before they are organized. So he's attacking them when they're not prepared. And um, obviously their their operational security is terrible. They simply weren't uh, prepared for this in any way. Now, it's a great victory for uh, the Spartans. They kill 600 Athenians, and they only lose a handful of uh, their own men. Barry, is it, um, it, would it be normal for the Spartans to have trained in defensive type warfare, right? Because it seems like this whole time, Brasidas and his troops are on the offensive, kind yeah. of choosing when, when they're moving right. and, and element of surprise. And now they're, to your point, bottled up to some degree. Is yeah. this common training that they would have received? No, I don't think it is. I mean, we did see Brasidas defending the city of Methoni, if you remember, at the very beginning of True. the war. So you had that experience. But it's not the Spartan way of war. The Spartan way of war is being on the offensive and fighting a conventional battle. Either that, both that and using cunning, using fraud, uh, tricking people in various ways. Um, they, they're really, really big on psychological warfare. Um, before the famous um, battle with the 300, they allow Persian spies to come to their camp on the outskirts of their camp and to see the Spartans doing gymnastics and combing their hair uh, as if they didn't have a care in the world. Also, Spartans alone of the Greeks wore very long hair because supposedly they believed that long hair made good looking men look better and ugly men look more frightening. Uh, they wore these famous scarlet cloaks. Uh, and they had shields with a lambda on them. Uh, and um, it's unclear if other Greek soldiers were barefoot or not, but Spartan soldiers were certainly barefoot. I mean, um, they scared people by their toughness and by their ability to drill on the parade ground. You know, I, I, I've done some rowing in my life, and uh, it was always said that it was really important in a race to launch your boat in a very uh, professional manner. So you'd, you'd strike terror in the side of the other team. Uh, it's not so easy. It's not so easy to uh, launch from the dock in a professional manner just to glide away. Um, but it's important to be able to do that. This is a small aside. I mean, the Spartans were doing that all the time. They're always engaging in psychological, psychological warfare. But you're right. Yeah, this is not what they're doing. And maybe to some extent, Brasidas is... Um, making it up as it goes along, uh, um, that, that could be uh, a part of, of what's going on here. And even, I mean, it sounds like he's taking the offensive advantage when he has it, right? Striking as they're in place, but still disorganized. He's moving out with a, a relatively large number of people to make, to, right. to raid or, or yeah. further disrupt the, yeah. the enemy. Yeah. Yeah, there's a scholar of this uh, battle who said if the Athenians had been halfway competent, Brasidas would have been stuck. He wouldn't have been able to uh, defend himself. Um, and there may be. Um, that may be. But I haven't gotten to the, the punchline, which is that uh, the Spartans kill the Athenian commander, Thucydides' enemy, Cleon. But the Athenians kill Brasidas. They both die. Supposedly, Brasidas lives long enough to know that they've won a victory and then he dies. The Athenians are unable to take the city back, and it really does hurt them uh, for the rest of the Peloponnesian War and indeed for the rest of their history. They always want to take it back and they never can. Brasidas, meanwhile, is given a remarkable honor by the people of the city. So um, going back a step, uh, remember when Brasidas appeared before the walls? I didn't mention, by the way, not only was it winter, he showed up in a snowstorm. He showed up in a snowstorm and talk about a psychological coup. Nobody's expecting this in a snowstorm. Um, when he allows them to leave, we should take it as a given that there are two factions in the city, as there are in every Greek city in this period. There's a pro-Athenian faction and a pro-Spartan faction. The people who want to fight are surely the pro-Athenian people, and they're the ones who have to leave. The pro-Spartan ones stay. When Brasidas is killed, um, the pro-Spartan faction so this was a colony, and every Greek colony had an official founder. Uh, often he was uh, a mythological character like Hercules. Heracles would be a founder. Um, I don't remember who their founder was, but they uh, get rid of him, and they make Brasidas their new founder. 
And uh, an archaeologist about 20 years ago found a remarkable discovery. She found a coffer with bones in it and a gold crown buried in the central part of the city. And we're told that Brasidas' bones were buried in the, the central part of the city. Um, there's reason to think that this is Brasidas' tomb. We can't be sure. It doesn't say Brasidas lies here. But uh, this might be Brasidas' tomb. Kind of amazing uh, to amazing to find this. Um, he's sort of a one-off. The, there aren't other Spartans who engage in tactics like his. But... There are other Spartans who engage in unusual tactics, and they win the war in the end by turning themselves into a naval power, uh, which they had never been before and which they had never wanted to be, because they felt that if going abroad will corrupt people, going abroad on ships will corrupt people even more. Because think how far you can go on ships. Ships need money. You got to have money. Uh, people see interesting things abroad. It's not the way to keep Sparta Spartan. But they do it. And also Persia, which was afraid of Athens in the beginning of the war, when Athens loses in a great, great defeat later on, the Persians join in. And so we see the Spartans engaging in, if not Brasidas' tactics, then, then unconventional tactics and winning this war, fighting this war in ways that they, they wouldn't have fought in before. So to some extent, in some ways, Brasidas is a one-off in other ways, he has a big impact on future generations in Sparta. That's fascinating. And I, I was just, I was smiling back here as you're talking about um, the, the possible corruption as you go to sea. And I'm thinking of any Navy veteran out there who's been on shore leave right. or wherever yeah. they go. Yeah. The yeah. To, uh, to, to this point, though, one of the, the, as I was doing some research, and I, I was hoping you might be able to fact check me, for those Spartans who surprisingly might not die in this in this um, military type environment mm -hmm. over the years at the age of 60 i think they're allowed to retire so yes kind of coming at 20 yes and yeah they're allowed to retire but as they get older you know it's more likely they would be kept at home to protect the city as kind of homeland security if there are any issues um the spartans are less likely to send the old men out to battle but they do sometimes send old men to, out to battle. I think we'd be surprised at how tough uh, these people are. Remember that um, they live, many of them live a rural existence. They're very, very hardy. They've done physical training all their lives. Um, they're eating austere and presumably healthy diet. Um, I think we'd probably be surprised. But yes, when the older ones are at home, and Athens, Athens does have walls, and they're the older men garrison the walls they're not out there fighting battles well I, I really appreciate you taking us through this kind of uh life cycle of of both the spartan and a real spartan that we have yeah. more information on than most yeah it's fascinating from the military historian and just those interested in that type of uh that type of lifestyle but i also wanted to take just a minute to talk about what's coming next for you i know you sure. have a book coming out in march and I also just wanted to, to talk a little bit more about what you've written in the past. So in March of 2022, we've got the war that made the Roman Empire, Antony, Cleopatra, and Octavian at Actium. So yeah. I wanted to spend just a minute on why did you choose this and what, are, what would we expect to see in this book? Sure. Well, I chose this because when I looked at Actium, um, I realized that it wasn't just a battle but it was a campaign. The battle is famous, but there was a campaign. And other people have pointed this out. But I don't think other people have looked in any detail at what the linchpin of that campaign was. Uh, ironically, it took place in the same place we we're talking about before Methoni, this very strategic point. Uh, this was the most important point on the supply route for the potential invasion force of Italy under Antony and Cleopatra. And six months before the Battle of Actium, um, the forces, the enemy forces of Octavian and his Admiral Agrippa, mainly his Admiral Agrippa, attacked Methoni in a surprise attack from the sea. And they took it by storm. It's not an easy thing to do, as we saw with Brasidas. Uh, they kill the commander, who oddly enough is a North African from uh, what's now Morocco, uh, far, far from home. And they take this place and they use it as a base to cut off supplies going to Antony and Cleopatra. So I think this is a brilliant example of what Sun Tzu called defeating the enemy by fighting his strategy. It's a brilliant example of the indirect 
uh, approach uh, to warfare. Um, so I, I'm really fascinated by this. Uh, the battle itself is, is totally fascinating. Anthony and Cleopatra, there's some other figures who have been underestimated, such as Octavian's sister and Antony's wife, Octavia, who I think was a very shrewd operator. And I also think people have underestimated the importance of family in this whole story. It's kind of a dynasty story. Uh, so it's got a little bit of everything. And I, I really had fun. And, and one, I, I was lucky enough to spend a leave at the Naval Plus Graduate School in Monterey. And some of my colleagues and students were incredibly helpful to me there, uh, giving me a sense of, of what modern amphibious operations are really like and what you can and cannot do. And then I went back and worked on my own and with ancient scholarship and fellow scholars of antiquity to try to see how could it, would it have been different in antiquity? How might this amazing operation have gone down, an operation that we know so little about? So I was really excited to write this book and I'm excited to get it out. I like, I just like the energy that you have as you talk about it. And oh, you thanks. may have just, you may have just touched on this, but um, this, I think is book nine. Is that right? Very. Uh, something like that. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Okay. Yeah. But I guess my point is, what is it that excites you most or what do you most enjoy when you're writing something like this? I, uh, this is a different topic than you've written about before, but similar in ancient history, um, military leadership, the, the campaigns, the battles. What is it that excites you most as you get into one of these books? I, uh, I love the research when I can. I love visiting the sites. I mean, just imagine how wonderful it is to have to visit sites in Greece and Italy and Turkey and et cetera and so forth. Um, but um, I love trying to recreate the people and trying to psych them out um, and trying to take a different take on people than, than others have have done before. I mean, I'm really lucky. There's so much great scholarship in the ancient world. Uh, and I'm, I'm really fortunate to be able to, to stand on the shoulders of giants, as they say. But I try to go a little further, do a little more with it. This fabulous archaeological work involving the Battle of Actium and, and ancient naval history. We found dozens of rams from ancient warships. We've excavated the victory monument that Octavian built at the site of his camp in Actium. We know so much more about it than, than, than we did. It's, it's just a great time to be working on this project. Oh, that's great. Well, hopefully, if you're okay with it, we will have you back when this is released. Um, I'd love I would, it. I'd love I'd to get love my hands it. on that, read it myself, and then we can talk thank more you. about that one in particular. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get you a copy. Thanks so much for the time, Barry, and bringing Brasidus and, and this experience to life. Uh, this is exactly what I was hoping to do. I, I, get, I don't know if I'm just a nerd about this, but I, I love <laughs> seeing this kind of detail and how they lived and fought and what it was like. And I'd love to just understand that better. So thank you for the time and the interview. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. It's a great pleasure. Thanks for asking such great questions. Thank you. And uh, until next time. So March until of next time. year. Hopefully. Okay. Thanks so much, Ryan. You take care. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. People often write to me with incredible stories and suggestions for interviews. If you want to share a combat story of your own or from someone you served with, record yourself for up to five minutes and email it to ryan at combatstory.com. I'll select some of these stories and feature them at the end of our episodes. Thanks for listening. Stay safe.